Welcome to the Highbury Squad. You can follow us on Twitter at Highbury Squad. In fact, it's the same on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and eventually iTunes. Join me, Sophie, aka at Soccer Diva, Amanda, aka at Guna Girl 1969, and our very special guest, Super Kev, Super Kevin Campbell. It's just like being down the pub with your mates. Welcome to another episode of the Highbury Squad. I've completely lost count. I think we're on 20 some. Wow. (laughs) Super Kevin Campbell takes it right in the box and smashes it in the back of the net. (laughs) Always aware is. Get (laughs) stuck in. Kevin Campbell. I'm starving. (laughs) Get stuck in, everyone. Say hi, Kevin, officially. Hi, everybody. And my uh, podcast sister, of course, um, Miss Princess Guna. We saved the best till last. Hello, girlfriend. Hello, girlfriend. How are you doing? <laughs> that was good. I just gave you a little bit of the Americanism right now. I'm doing great, and here's why. Um, you two have been raving about this young fella for a number of years. Um, you have both had the pleasure of being in his company. Kev has had the absolute pe- pleasure of being coached by him. Theo Foley has been involved in professional football for over six decades as a player, coach and manager. During the early days of his playing career, whilst captain of Northampton Town, listen to this, Guna Nation, Theo also ran a pie and chip shop to supplement his income from football, a far cry from the riches footballers enjoy today. It wasn't as easy back then. In his new autobiography, Theo, Give Us a Ball, A Life in Football, he's co-authored with his son, Paul, and Theo details the highs and lows of professional football. And the foreword is um, by none other than one of Arsenal's greatest managers, George Graham. But as Super Kevin Campbell said, George Graham couldn't have done it without him. Please give a very warm welcome to the Highbury squad for Mr. Theo Foley, kids. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I'll just get stuck right in here, as uh, Super Kev says. You know, you played in four divisions um, of the Football League, as it was then. Uh, You also played for the Republic of Ireland nine times. Um, And you really had an extended career as well, Theo, in coaching. Let's talk about that bit because this is the bit of the book that I really love a lot and in terms of the write-up for the book is the comparison of how it was then to now. Before we get stuck into some nuts and bolts and anecdotes, talk to me about what you, how you feel when you see the modern game today versus the type of game you were involved in um, at the height of your career. That's a totally different game. Possession being the main thing and people just have to keep the ball in order to make indentures in the other team's performance and the way the system that is set up. It's slightly different. It's not as exciting, not as thrilling. Developing some great players, but we could do really with the game a bit more open. It won't happen, obviously. But it is it, it is a great game. It still is a great game. But when you see the best teams playing it, then you realise how good it is. Uh, as far as we were concerned, if you had a ability at all, you displayed it as quickly as possible and you got away from what you were doing. That's me. Okay. <laughs> Just, oh, it's, it's honestly, Theo, it's such a pleasure for me to have you on our podcast because I grew up Highbury, middle 70s was for me and I know you and George came in in the 80s just a quick question about my podcast brother what was it like to work with Kevin Campbell he was wonderful lad he he was actually just about coming through when we were there Ricey was a big influence on him he had a great personality and he was pleasant to everybody as he went around his work most people there were there was very very few people at Arsenal that were grumpy or anything like that, and Kevin certainly wasn't one of them. He's a great lad. I didn't have, you know, I, 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 he only came in, in, in the, into, the, into the squad. I wasn't involved with him as such. Rice he was, but there you go. Mm. Arsenal was a splendid club. Mm. And for Kevin Campbell, it was, 
obviously a place to be. So easier to work with, work with back then, Theo, than on the podcast today. Eh? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> there you go, Kev. No, well, it's a pleasure. No, he is, you don't often he, get he is, top is, people. He, well, you know what he is. He's always on it, you know. And one yeah. of the things that he talked to us about, but I wanted to hear it from you and then get Kev's take on it with you on the line because it's just such a wonderful moment. Um, he was talking to us and has told us the story a couple of times of that first day of pre-season, George Graham's speech to the whole squad, you know, where you had the um, the elder statesman, uh, you know, the team that was really the driving force behind the gunners. And then, you know, you had the young, young guns like Rocky, like Kev. Um, and, yeah. you know, Kev remembers that speech verbatim like it was yesterday. And it was his first day on YTS as well, which is unbelievable. Talk us through that first day and your memories and thoughts and, and the preparation as well, because um, I think from the book and from what Kev is saying that you helped prepare that speech too. <laughs> I did. The only thing I didn't prepare him for was I told you to come in a bow tie. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> it couldn't have been a Thursday. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> no, I mean, it was, Arsenal was, is, is arguably the best club, in my opinion, in the world. Everything they do, they do it properly. Uh, they try as hard as they can to please everybody, which isn't an easy task. But the young players are aware of the discipline. I don't know how strong it is now, but it was very strong with Ricey. It was with all of them. And over the years, they developed some wonderful players. There's no doubt about that. Kevin obviously found it hard because it is harder when you're not being bought for big money as a forward player. But he, he he was brilliant. I mean, people like Tony Adams, David Rowcastle, bless him, Michael Thomas, you know, they, they were just superb players. And what what happens is that you get a chance to show what you can do because you know if you do the work, put the work in, you will definitely get a chance. That's me. That's the way I saw him. I didn't have great... Uh, I've never been to a place where, well, I was at Burnley when I started. It was the same sort of place. But uh, Burnley, unfortunately, let me go. What a mistake that was. <laughs> Theo, uh, could you could you just explain to, to everybody on the pod what the mindset was like in developing young players? Because I think what tends to happen now is young players don't really get a chance. But when you and George came in, I think it was open open season because a lot of the youngsters were were filled with 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 promise because it seemed that you were going to give them a chance if they, obviously if they done the work. So, you know, what was the mindset of 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 you guys coming in? Well, uh, I think that what you do, Kevin, and you don't need me to tell you this, that if you're good enough. The only way to show how good you are is to get out there and do it. There's no no hiding. There's like the Tony Adams, David again, you know, all, all the young lads, Mickey Thomas who come in the team, Martin Hayes, you know, players who, who are just getting in. And what happens is they get in the team, but they have to stay there. That's the hard bit. And at one time... There was about six of them in there, but they were bloody marvellous players. And that's what it's about. It, yeah, well, but Theo, well and truly. Theo, if, if, you, if you remember yeah. correctly, and I remember this so well, you not only bought the likes of Lee Dixon and, and Steve Bold and integrated them well, but I believe it was the coaching that really brought the lads on because the coaching was so good. In, yeah. in my eyes, and is that something you still believe in, that if the coaching's good, you can develop the, the younger players quicker? Well, if it isn't, Kevin, you shouldn't be there. <laughs> it's very you know true. What I mean? you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be in the place. That's your job, to coach and to help as much as you can. There comes a line where, as I said, when we got there, there was a lot of players who were moved out. But when, when the players come in to charge... But Alan, you know, all of them, you can go through any of them. They were all outstanding players. Kevin Richardson's another one who comes to mind. And Steve Williams, you know, there, there was players there that were just 
a joy. Paul Davis, they were just yeah. a joy to train and to work with. And I don't think anybody had treated them like we did. Yes. And the reason for that was was obvious that that was the way our only hope of, of getting them through. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you know, Theo, um, what you're saying is really interesting. And, and, you know, we talk a lot on our podcast about man management. You know, there's one thing coaching a team, but there's a totally different um, aspect of man managing a player. Uh, and it felt like at the time the coaching team at Arsenal really knew how to manage players and understand the character and their individuality. Um, and I think you've mentioned too that Tony Adams had a great knack for getting the players going and firing them up in training. Yeah. Talk us through that a little well, bit. Certainly, and certainly he, he learned he learned from when George made him captain. He knew he knew what George wanted, and everybody mm. knew what George wanted. And George would never run away from anything that was necessary to be done, no matter how big they thought they were or how, how high they fall, he always was aware of that. He had no no sides, no bits, no favourites, really, and that's really what took him all the way along. He learned a lot at youth level, as I did, and I, because I went in the other end first and then worked really hard to make sure that players would understand what you were trying to do. It was very simple, really, George. It was just... Everything he did was simple, and it's the same with me. I hope that helped people. I never criticized them unnecessarily, nor did I talk behind their back and make out they were anything else. And that, mm. to me, is very important. Yeah, and we see too much of that in in the modern game. And you know, when when well, you when you when when you talk about um, Tony Adams and his impact on the pitch. And, you know, the fact that it was almost like having another coach on the pitch. But I, I also think from anecdotes and books and things that we can look back on in the history of Arsenal and your time there, you had a massive impact. And maybe I'll let Kevin answer this first and lead into you. You had a massive impact on players and and the con- being that conduit between George and the players, because George could be a little harsh at times, too. No, Kev? Yeah, yeah I, I- I, I, sorry, Phil. Can I just say, I think George didn't want to be close to the players. I think that, in, in my eyes, that always was your job. You laughed and joked with the lads and you, you kind of got around them. You know, you, you, you were like a glue. Whereas George was a lot more serious. Training was serious. Training was tough. And getting that point across, you know, George had the respect of the, of the team. But you needed that softer side. I mean, you were tough as well, but you were kind of more approachable. And I believe that that really made for a great double act, one-two punch. Very good, Kevin. I, I would take the plaster off a bit softer than George would. Yeah, big time. <laughs> You'd rip it and then put his finger in it. Yeah. Was it a little bit good cop, bad cop? <laughs> no, it was good, It was bad cop, worse cop. <laughs> I don't believe. Uh, the, only thing, the only thing was, I always felt that George was always high and ready to be at them, which was his job. Because mine was to try and pick the ones up who he'd knocked down and pick them up and make sure that they were going somewhere. And there was a, there was a lot of good players there. Don't worry about that. But George's awareness of what was going on, he could always sense when it wasn't right with everybody. And he, he wouldn't say, are you happy with that? He'd say, this is what we're doing, so get on with it. You understand where I'm coming from? I would sort of reason it out if I could. And he would go, no, 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 we're going, this is what we're doing. But yeah. he, would, he would listen. He would definitely listen to what I had to say. And for a Paddy, that's pretty good. <laughs> Theo, <laughs> Theo, for the amount of years you were with us, yeah. The amount of players, <laughs> the amount of players that came and, you know, come and go, out of all the talent that we had that you worked with, was there anyone that left us that you were really totally gutted about that you could see great potential in, but just didn't make it under George or George didn't rate him? David Rollcastle. Yeah, but he did make David it with Rollcastle. us, Theo. 
Yeah, he did. David Rawcastle was a great, great player. To be taken away like he was, was terrible for me. Fantastic. Yeah. But then I have to go back to Tony because Tony was young. And, it, and even the older ones knew that George, when he made a statement and he stuck with it, Baldy, Lee Dixon, Winterbourne, Winterbourne was a tremendous player. He brought good players as well, which was very, very important. And the likes of Kevin and other lads who, who, who were in, in the team, the young boys, they knew that if they were good enough, and they had to be good, they would get a chance. He wouldn't, he wouldn't go away from them. He wouldn't go, no, I'm not going to play. He would put David Hillier, people like that, he would put them in because he knew what he would get back from them. I mean, he brought Stady Bold, Nigel, Nigel Winterbourne, Lee Dixon, players at the back. They were, they were all right from Stoke and that and Wimbledon. But what did he see in them? He saw really good players. And maybe the other people didn't see it. Theo, I, I think the, the, look, sometimes, you know, the likes of... Because when you first came in, Martin Keown left, didn't he? Yeah. He left. And obviously, a few years later down the road, Andy Cole left. You know, was there any yeah. regrets of, of those guys leaving? Because obviously Martin Keown came back and Andy Cole had such a fantastic career. Is there any Martin regrets? Cole, no, no, Martin Keown wasn't very, very, very respectful to me. I actually spoke to Martin Keown. And when I went in there, he said, I don't want to stay. So I said, that's okay. <laughs> he said, what wow. do you mean? I said, if you don't want to stay, you can go. Yeah. And that was me speaking because George was busy. Um, Andy Cole was a really good player, but a very sour boy in, in my eyes. I didn't work with him then, but as a young boy, he was tremendous talent. Yeah. And he had to be patient. If you, if you took George on, Kevin, you knew you were losing unless yeah. you were outstanding. That yeah. was, that was the bottom line. And even in his darkest days, Tony Adams knew he had one person who, who always would pull him in the team. Yeah. And the majority of the lads who were in the team meant the same. In other words, if you did the job, he didn't care what your activities were outside. Yeah, very true. I want to wow. talk, can I just pick up on that, Theo, actually, talking about the activities? Because there was the Tuesday club, wasn't there? There was a lot of drinking involved. And obviously now, <laughs> it's, it's unheard of. I wasn't in that. <laughs> I couldn't get it. Now I was too old. <laughs> um, nowadays, we, we that Tuesday club was going on. Sorry, and we didn't mind as long as as long as it didn't interfere. Yeah, what was going on. I was going to say that. Really, I was going to say that. Yeah, uh, Amanda, let me just tell you a little bit about the Tuesday club, and and this was one <laughs> of the most important things about George Graham and Theo and that that staff. What when they came into the club. I think they knew that there were some clicks in the first team squad. Yeah. And, and what they said is, look, we're going to train you hard. We know you're going to need some um, some downtime. But what we don't want is clicks. So it's either you all go out or none of you go out. Mm. And, and wow. That, and that's why the Tuesday club happened, because everybody just club just came together and wanted to be around each other because the training was brutal. It was tough. It really was. Yeah. It was good. They had to burn off all those calories drinking every uh, <laughs> no, every no, Tuesday no, and it, beyond. Uh, what, what, what Kevin is saying, if you went in the club, <laughs> you went made feel felt a little bit different than anything else, but mm. you knew if you wanted to get on with, with the teammates, oh, that's the place to be. Now that went on in, in most clubs in in in, my, in that day, and in my day particularly as well. There was a lot more people who drank. Now now they don't. They they speak French and they get in their cars and they go. <laughs> they certainly do. You mentioned the player, and I'd love to just hear one of your favourite anecdotes on Rocky Rowcastle. Obviously, he's a player that is revered in Arsenal's history. Um, you had a really great relationship with Rocky. Give us a, give us an anecdote, um, Theo. Tell us something um, about Rocky that, that you loved or one of your favourite stories. I, I, just, I just couldn't describe him in words, but he was such a perfect gentleman of a boy. 
I used he actually, I used to bring him into my house and bring him to the, to the training ground because he lived in in Lewisham and he didn't have a car. But as a boy, he was just humble and he was he was himself and he, he was funny. He was good to be with. Uh, if you told him off, as most of them lads, Kevin will tell you, Mickey Thomas, Gus Caesar. Although I'm not saying that because of the colour that they were. I'm saying that they were just wonderful people. He was a wonderful person, David. And everybody, everybody in Arsenal absolutely loved him. From the cleaners to the office people, anybody. He'd walk in, hello. There was no, no barriers whatsoever with him. Uh, wonderful human being. Theo, could you just tell everybody how, how good he was? Because mm. <laughs> I remember oh. um, at times, George, he was so good on the ball, George had to restrict him in training, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He did. He did. He was, he was a wonderful player. There was nothing he couldn't do. And if somebody thought about kicking him like Stuart Pearce or some of them, that didn't mm. worry him one bit. He didn't mind anybody having a kick at him. Whereas most wide players, if you kicked him, that would be them looking for the way home. No, he, was, he was a wonderful individual and he had wonderful talent. Great great control, great pace, great shots. So all in all, he was just a marvellous bloody player. That was it. And a wonderful person. Theo, mm. can I just ask something? Next week we play uh, Tottenham at the Emirates next Sunday. And obviously for... For me, for all Arsenal fans, that was our biggest game. It still is. I don't care what anyone says. It still means so much to the fans. What was it like yeah. the morning of Derby Day? Say we were playing at White Hart Lane, um, and I'm assuming you all stayed in a hotel and you travelled to White Hart Lane. Did, did, the, did the players who weren't local boys really understand what it actually meant? They certainly did, because you just have told them what it was like. Mm. Mm. Tudors had told him what it meant what it meant to Arsenal players what it meant to Tottenham players and Arsenal players would be thinking they'll get sick they'll have to stay indoors for a week <laughs> the Tottenham yeah. players were the same I mean no that, that, that's embedded that definitely without any doubt so Theo it's great to know that the uh, player, players actually knew what it meant because it meant everything to us and it still does and we're already buzzing for next Sunday. Um, so just like keeping with that theme, knowing what it meant to us, and then watching George Graham cross the divide to White Hart Lane to become their manager, what what was your take on that? Simple answer is it was a job that came up. It was a great club. Don't let anyone kid you that Tottenham's not a great club, but it's just that that was a job that came up, and he decided to take it. And it he obviously knew he was going to get a fair amount of stick and abuse for, for doing it, and that's it. There's very little else I could say, but he, his type of person, George, was embedded Arsenal, and so were the Tottenham boys the same. So you just have to forget that and get on with it. And it was a job. And when you're out of work, that's what you do. Theo, did you think at the time, though, when George did take that job, that it was... He was so maybe upset, a little bitter even, about the fact that he had to leave the club that he loved, the club that he resurrected. Do you think yeah. it was him kind of sticking the two fingers up at Arsenal in, in a way? Yes, it probably was. But the biggest thing of all was that he he's Arsenal through and through, and everybody knew that. But that doesn't mean that a part you can splinter off and do what you do. You do. Um, I know that's a bit Irish, but you know that's how you are. <laughs> but by the time you get, if you get there and you're working, and if you're out of work, that's that's what you do, and that's what he did. Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't think anybody would doubt where George's love, love was. Okay, so Theo, I get that. I don't. I sort of get it, and I don't get it because <laughs> I don't think I could have done it, but. Knowing that he was Arsenal through and through, what was it like for him then on Derby days when all of a sudden he's Tottenham manager and he's got to play Arsenal? He, he just didn't go to the dugout. <laughs> <laughs> you, want, 
<laughs> he wanted to sit in the right dugout. He had to sit in the wrong one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I have the same here at Millwall in Charlton. People always say to me, how could you possibly work at Millwall after working at Charlton? The answer is simple. I had four kids and I needed yeah. money. Yeah, that's fair enough. And that's it. It's a job. And, it's and like, I, had, yeah. I had great, great love for Charlton. And when I went and worked at Millwall, I can assure you, I absolutely loved it. It was a great place to be. But it's, you have to do it. You're just a professional. I mean, mm. it's the only unfortunate bit is it's, they're too near. So you're likely to get more stick than anybody else. It's strictly business, isn't it? It's just strictly business. Yeah, yeah. You turn it off, it's getting money, Kevin, and you just have to do it, and there's no other way out of it. And as far as I was concerned, I treat the football club with respect. If they treat me with respect, that's all I wanted. Arsenal, as I said, Arsenal was a fantastic club for somebody like me. So for George, it must have been absolutely heartbreaking. But there you go. Yeah, and and, uh, people didn't really uh, earn the same kind of money back in that day. Now an assistant coach, someone, you know, who works for a Mourinho or a Pep or a Klopp, you know, those guys can easily retire on the kind of money that they're making these days. Um, we, we do have some questions as well. There's a, there are a lot of Arsenal fans out there that, um, that want to hear from you as well. Um, but before we get to some of those questions, I have to ask you this because Dean, um, who was very kind to help us arrange the interview today, shared some, um, nicknames that you had for some of the players back in the day. And I'm sure <laughs> Lee Dixon and, and, uh, and Perry Groves will be happy to hear, uh, that we have our hands on those nicknames. Talk us through those a little bit. And how did, how did Dixon become? Was it Wiggy? <laughs> <laughs> Who? Lee Dixon? Maybe I've got that one wrong. What, what, what was your, what was your nickname for Lee Dixon? I don't know what it was. I can't remember what it was. It, 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 it was more. Wiggy. It, it was, was Wiggy, yeah. yeah it was. I, and I, Marwood was Bumsy. I probably had nicknames for everybody uh, that I picked, that I invented myself and put them in, and anybody who didn't like them would obviously call me Paddy. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 that was a <laughs> simple way to get out of it. But I was never, never afraid, as Kevin will tell you, to, uh, to pull anybody up. You know, and I have a golden on that. Dick Dicko was a great lad. Grovesy was all right. Uh, you know, country boy, wasn't he? I used to give him a bit of stick as well. <laughs> to be honest with you, it didn't mean anything. There was never anything nasty, and that's what they knew. Um, I can't remember what did I call Grovesy anyway. So apparently, I don't know if I, sh- I should say this out loud, but I will because <laughs> it's a podcast, so we can. But according to my sources, Theo, you called Grosey shit house, and that's only because <laughs> he used to try and trip you up all the time, and you would end up chasing <laughs> Grosey, which sounds about right. I mean, he was a bit pacey, yes, but I, I think you could have caught him. I always, I always had names for him, but I never, I never <laughs> had any malice against him. I just that was me, and they were the same with me. As long as I didn't go too far, they called me Paddy. <laughs> well, I could I could add to that, Theo. If if the player never liked the, the nickname, Theo would offer them out and say, like, we, we can have a scrap <laughs> about it. I'm, I'm, de- I'm deadly serious. And Theo was a tough son of a gun, right? And him, the fights him and Qu- Niall Quinn had are legendary, yeah. by the way. Oh, brilliant! Yeah. Uh... Well, Quinny, Quinny was a, Quinny was another one. He was a stroppy devil. He was. <laughs> <laughs> he'd, start, he'd start running slow and be at the back, and then I'd go go at the back and push him up. No, but, but I mean, the atmosphere then was it was really good, and that, that's what it was. Um, I just felt that if I could liven it up, and I, I always had that Irish wit. <clears throat> when you come from where I come from, if you didn't have an answer, you must be dead, or they'd shoot you. So it was as simple as that. Okay. Theo, oh, Theo, just quickly, can you explain when Rocky was trying to teach you to, to reggae dance? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's a great one. 
That was a great one. Well, what was what, what was so charming about him was that nobody could upset him. Nobody. And he was as tough as you like. And anybody who thought any differently got a shock. I mean, top players kicked him or, you know, get put at him. But he, he never, ever, ever showed what he really was. And as a boy, it was, he, I, used to, I used to take him to the training ground, didn't I? Come to you, my house in the morning. I used to take him, and you, you, did. you know he was he just one of them boys, and he, he he wouldn't he wouldn't sort of put on you, but he knew the people who liked him and did what they did for him. George liked him, but he he never he never probably got as close to him as I did. Yeah, but Theo, was it was the end of season party, <laughs> and some reggae music came on, and you said I could do that dance. <laughs> and if you remember rightly, Rocky was teaching you to do the dance, and you ended up doing it. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Everybody was. I remember. <laughs> I remember that. I did it. I did it with, with your mum, didn't I? As well. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. It's epic. It's all coming Mama out Campbell. now. <laughs> yeah. David. David was, as I said, and he was. He, they were just great. Mickey was great as well, and and Kevin as Kevin and Gus. Gus was a little bit more influential to me. It was yeah. more in the middle of the in the middle of the of the ballroom, as it were. No, my dancing skills are very limited, I'm afraid. <laughs> Irish dancing, that was it, nothing else. <laughs> oh, Theo, I've got to talk to you about my favourite night ever. Oh, hold on a second. No. Is this the one million five hundred and seventy eight <laughs> time we're gonna hear amanda mention 89 <laughs> it could be yes. it, hey. it could be i have a question hey, for hey, you hey, theo that someone sent in i'll play in a second but um i couldn't let anyone down to say that i would not mention the 26th of may 1989 um I was there, like you were, and like Kevin was. But um, I've just got a question for you um, from someone that um, wants to ask you something. Hold on. Far away. Theo, this is Kelvin. Prince is Gunas dad. I just wonder what your <laughs> memories are of that fantastic day, 26th of May, 1989, when we went up to Anfield and, well, we know what happened, don't we? Wonderful day. It was, it was arguably one of the best days of my football in life and yesterday I think we could do it I thought it would be bloody hard and it was but George was absolutely brilliant on that and it was just amazing what they did the behaviour of the Liverpool fans obviously they thought they'd won it yeah was amazing yeah and they were stunned like we were and when Michael Thomas scored a goal like that everybody was stunned but we weren't shocked. We we really genuinely thought we could do it. Um, I'll never forget it. It was it was a, one of the best nights in football, and it will mm. never ever happen again. So it was it was such a special night, wasn't it? Go on, Amanda. No one's going to yeah. take this moment from no, you. Keep not. going, PG. Not. Keep going, babe. <laughs> Keep going. You got I, Theo on the line. <laughs> Theo, I've heard so many different stories. Some from Kev, some from other players like Dave Hillier. We've spoken to. Um, I want to know: <laughs> Did you ever, at any moment, think that we were going to win? Because I think George did think that. He did say that if he got nil nil to half time. The, there oh, was a yeah. big chance. Did you feel yeah. like that as well? I did because I felt that what he was preaching into them would, would stick, and they they believed it. That that was the reason it happened. No, 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 no doubt about that. And he knew that they would get frustrated as it went on, and they proved that by taking Rushy off, which proved mm -hmm. that they were settling for a draw. Mm -hmm. And that's a fact. Which no, no charges. You can look upon George as being clever, but he was more than clever there. It was a mind game with Kenny, and obviously at the cop, with all the fans in there who behaved impeccably. We, you know, when we give the flowers out and all that, and the hold up to the game was a big thing, I think. For us, not so much for them. But all in all, yes, I did think we'd win. Uh, but the manner in which we won was incredible. Oh, yeah, 
It was the best footballing night of my life. It will never be beaten unless we beat Tottenham in a Champions League final in the last seconds. I can't imagine that ever be beaten. You never know. Don't close the door. I would never close the door, but I don't think my heart could take it if we played Tottenham in the Champions League final, if I'm honest. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't even take it today after that Bournemouth match. But um, can I just ask you, Theo, after we've won it, uh, what happens in the uh, Liverpool boot boot room after the game with like Roy Evans, etc.? Oh, they were, they were absolutely marvellous. And we were in the boot room as we always did there. The whiskey bottles came out and Kenny was there and George and me and the rest of the lads, Steve, uh, and Stuart and, and Pat Rice. They, they were just wonderful. It, it's, how they took it as well as that, I don't know. Whether they all cried when they went out, but they were wonderful to us. The only thing is the whiskey bottles had to be emptied. And I mean it. <laughs> um, Theo, I think I think they're a great club as well. And especially what yeah, they'd been through one. six weeks previously at Hillsborough yeah, was it was so emotional that night. Ah, Everything was so yeah, emotional. They're wonderful people. I think they are wonderful people. I live I live in Dublin as you, I lived in Dublin as a boy and I think they're similar to that. Similar to Cockneys and, and that, in, in that they're close to everything. They haven't yeah. got any real sides. Some of them maybe react differently to other things, but no. There's one, one of them. Kenny Dalglish, for me, is one of the nicest people I've ever met. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. I, I love this Liverpool mm. loving and this Liverpool love fest, but I just before we let you go, Theo, I have to know that moment that, when you see Steve McMahon on the pitch, and it's the best clip ever where he's telling all the players one minute, one minute, and they've got that cheeky grin yeah. on their faces as though, wow, we've got them here. Just hang on, boys, yeah. for one more minute. And then yeah. the most majestical call ever in the history of football commentary, Brian Moore, where he's talking about yeah, McMahon is down, yeah. everyone's abject. It's the best moment in football. and. To be part of that, tell us about that a little bit, because at that moment when you see that, are you still believing with one minute to go that we've got a chance? No, well, I'm I'm telling Luke to kick it. <laughs> That's the way you know, so yeah, he, Everyone did. That's the way Kick it. <laughs> kick it, yeah. Don't throw it out to Dicko. Yeah. That's what he <laughs> no did. one wanted Dicko and to They get said, the ball. shut up, just get on with it. <laughs> and that's the truth they really did I thought why is he throwing the ball out there's a minute to go but that's how it was and that's that's how it ended up it was yeah. amazing Theo and can I just flick. sorry go on go on no no no, no, no you carry on no you yeah. carry on it's important the little flick from Smudger was incredible Chris Nickel couldn't make his mind up and the keeper came and that was the end of it I knew Michael had scored and he was the coolest man on the planet. Yeah, but you say that, Theo, but he missed one a few minutes before. Very yeah, similar. Yeah, he missed a chance. Yeah. He missed a chance, but if you get him in there twice, you yeah. definitely score one. So, Theo, That's the last... my belief. Sorry, so we, the last time we met was at the 89 uh, preview where, you know, I was doing some interviews and stuff. I watched yeah. the film. Can I ask what you thought of the film? It was very good. It was... Uh, it's difficult for me because I'm, I'm not I'm not being modest. It, it, it's not a big part for me to be in, but I enjoyed how it was done. I have mm. it in here in, in the room. But um, yes, it was very very good. I thought that the way that you put it all together was absolutely marvelous in, in as quick as time as you did, and that's what it's about. But you've got to realize I'm not I'm not a kidding chef. I'm not a, a big fish in that pond. So I did. I knew what it was like. And that's what I am. I loved it. I wow. loved it. I loved the bit at the end. People should go and um, get it for Christmas. But the bit at the end, the way they did that, I've just, I actually thought he wasn't going to score. I was getting very stressed watching it. But... <laughs> did I only... speaking, speaking, speaking of things Arsenal fans should get for Christmas, there can't be a better stocking stuffer than Theo give us a ball, oh, a life in football. Honestly, it's the be- And you wrote it with your son as well, Theo. A wonderful book, yes. so many great memories. And one of the things um, I was talking to Kev about before we came on air is there's so many new Arsenal fans. 
but to truly understand the history of a club, where it comes from, what the DNA of the club is, you really have to see and understand and look at the past. And that era and, and those moments that you and Kev were involved in um, are just as significant, if not even more so than the Invincibles year. Um, because you guys laid the groundwork for Arsenal Football Club to be the club that it is today. And to be part of that must be really special for you to look back on. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant. Paul Paul is not well, and that's why he's done so well at the book. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in contact with Paul and it was really lovely to get the book. I can't wait. I'm I've just started reading it, Theo, so I'll finish it soon. Just just lovely, lovely that we've got those memories and the pictures. Everyone should get this book, it, especially if you followed Arsenal in the 80s, that's for sure. Yeah, of course you should. It's very good. <laughs> uh, guys, what I'm, I've got to say, Theo, I've got to thank you for really looking after me when I was at the club Aww. because not a lot of people know. Me and Theo used to have a bet when I was in the youth team. <laughs> And I used to, I used to take some money. Used to bet me I wouldn't get a hat trick and stuff like that. And I used to take quite a bit of, of money off Theo. <laughs> didn't I, Theo? <laughs> Theo really looked after me because at, at that time I was only earning twenty seven fifty a, a, a week, and you know, just on the first rung of the ladder. And Theo and I struck up a very good relationship. And I, yep. it was a bit of motivation for me, Theo, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Sure it was. Um, you were very lucky because uh, Royce is the same. Royce is a great lad. Yeah. <clears throat> Pat was a good lad. He was under pressure always with everybody else under pressure to yeah. do well. And that's what he did with the team. And you came through and that's that's what it's about, Kevin. Yeah, brilliant. Amazing. But, uh, just got to thank you for you, honestly. Because I, I never, do you know, I never got the chance when you left. No, you you, you could have come and seen me. I live in Blackheath. She would have said you could have come <laughs> over and seen me. But I wasn't in South London when you when you moved. I didn't even know you were gone. Next minute, Stuart Houston was the was the uh, assistant. Yeah, don't forget, I I came here in in uh, in sixty odd, and I've stayed in this house all all the time and travelled, as you know. Yeah. Because I, I like the house and I like where I am. Yeah, you stay where you there are. There you go. Yeah, I had brilliant. four kids. And when we got a colour telly, that was the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Brilliant. Amazing. What are you doing What's... now, Kevin? Sorry, Theo? What are you, what, what are you doing now? What, what, what's your role now? Well, I, I'm into, so I've been in security for uh, near on to near, right. nearly 12 yeah. years. Um. Yeah. Really enjoyed the, the the business side of it. I'm a, I'm a ambassador for the group, and uh, it, it's it's really interesting. I do mentoring. I, I do men. I mentor young kids who get get released from clubs. I also do stuff for the Bring Hope Humanitarian Foundation regarding uh, a football initiative in refugee camps in Iraq and and in Africa. And then oh, I'm yeah. a dad to two boys who play football. So. I don't really have much time to myself. You're marvellous. But it's good. Yeah. I, it's good to give and, back. And he's a co-host here on the Highbury Squad Pod. Yeah, I know. We love I know him. He's a, I know he's, yeah. A, yeah, I know he's a big star. Yeah, yeah <laughs> doing some TV yeah. doing, doing some TV work as well. And there's no man on TV that wears a dicky bow better than our Kev, that's for sure. No, no, he looks very smart in a dicky bow. He I does. turn the brightness up, so as I can see <laughs> <laughs> well, Theo, I'm going to have to say that we're going to... How about we bring you back towards the end of the season and we can see how the Arsenal have done and we can catch up a little bit more, share more stories from the book yeah. and get you, get you back on here. And, um, you know, thanks to Dean, um, giving Dean a shout out for helping us arrange today's chat. And we wish nothing but... Um, you know, well wishes to you and your family and Paul. Um, we know it's not an easy time and we just uh, wanted to say thank you for making time for us today and sharing your stories. There's nothing quite like it and we really appreciate that. Thank you, Theo. Thank you very much. Give my love to everybody. Oh, we love you, Theo. Love, love you, Theo. Take Bye -bye. care and I'll, I'll, I'll drop you a and text you after, Theo. God bless. Take thank care. You, 
Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Happy Christmas. Bye bye. Bye. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas. So that was so lovely having Theo Foley on. Oh, I sort of feel like all like humble and honoured and stuff to have to chat to him because obviously me growing up through the 80s at Highbury, he was just as important to me as George Graham was, you know. So thanks, Theo, for coming on. Right. Well, you two, we played Mm. Bournemouth today. (laughs) And I'm just going to say now that I'm hosting this part. And I'm the, I, we haven't got the ref on today. I'm going to be the ref. Because if anyone could see our WhatsApp group, I go away for 10 minutes and there was about, and I seriously, 19 messages between you two arguing. So I'm going to let you both get your points across. Okay. So we, we narrowly <laughs> beat Bournemouth 2-1. Um, it's given us 17 unbeaten, which is fantastic. Um, over my ang scored, which is what we needed and what he needed. I thought, uh, our first goal was probably one of the goals of the season from the own goal. Poor bloke. I've never seen an own goal as good as that apart from Dixon when he did that at Highbury all those years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. and you know what? Overall, right? Overall, um, first of all, I, I, I absolutely effing hate that kit. I just can't even look at it. It just makes oh. me puke. I don't even know what Mint Green's got to do with Arsenal, but forget that. It's not important. Um, I wasn't um, entirely sure about the uh, line-up when it came out, which is the first time I felt like that. Then I found out that Lacazette had a tight groin and it was a precautionary thing. Because obviously he's not going to drop him. He wasn't even a sub. Um, and I wasn't sure where, where we were going with this, if you know what I mean. But because I trust Emery, um, I didn't, didn't slag him off or anything. I was just like, mm, a bit unsure about this. But I have to say, as the uh, game went on, I do feel he made the right subs. But, okay, so I'm going to go to Sophie first. And it's a very short answer, Sophie. What was your issue? I mean, short. Um, <laughs> what was your issue with how we played first half? Okay. So, in a nutshell, if I can encapsulate my WhatsApp um, convo with Kev, is that I was – alluding to who we're playing next right and it's great we've gone 17 unbeaten and in that 17 unbeaten is a draw against Liverpool our first two games of the season too soon too close to call for Emery you know the Chelsea game yes we should have won but my point to Kev was enough with the we should have won type responses because we're now at a point and yes we're still growing with Emery But we need to win certain games and win them convincingly. And my argument was, why do we have to suffer for the last 10 minutes in most games against teams like Bournemouth, Cardiff, Wolves? Those teams we've been playing lately, who we haven't dominated the same way we should. Spurs ripped Chelsea a brand new arsehole yesterday. They absolutely thrashed them. And all I was saying was, if we want to beat the scum, we have to perform a lot better than that. Am I happy with our evolution? Absolutely. Are there improvements in the team? 100%. Are we seeing growth in certain players? No doubt. But if we want to take it to the next level, we can't just be satisfied with, oh, we won, but by narrow margins. And we're on a 17 unbeaten run, which is great for confidence. And you see that in the tweets the players um, are posting after the game. We just need to crank it up a notch. And I understand Emery doesn't have his own players yet. He's still working with Wenger's players and a couple of new signings that he made in the summer, that one of them is the most important player now for Arsenal, and that's Torreira. Why he made that sub, I don't know. But regardless of that, that was my point. Yes, we've made progress. Yes, we're doing okay. But we can't play like that against the big teams and we haven't won against the big teams yet so far this season. That was my point. Okay, Kev, I'm going to let you answer it. <laughs> ding, ding, yeah. round yeah, one. No, I'll be honest with you. The, the point I'm trying to make is on, on the WhatsApp was you've got to take every game as an individual 
we know our limitations as a football team. We know where we need to strengthen. We can't say we need to step up um, too much because we know this team isn't the finished article. We perform against Liverpool for two halves. That's the only game we've played two halves this season against a top team. That's the only time. So we will revert back to type. We started off pretty slowly today and we stepped it up second half and got the win. And that tends to be the way we operate. Who knows what we're going to do next week? Yeah, of course, we have to perform next week. But the way Arsenal are playing, can they step up big time? We don't know because we've only ever seen it once. So let's just take the win and then we'll see how next week goes because we don't even know who's going to be fit, etc. Okay. That was my point. OK, and I get But that. we can't get in the hole. That's my point. We cannot get in a hole against the Spurs. It's OK against Cardiff and Wolves and Bournemouth because maybe there's ways in the end where the quality and our quality in the second half are killed them up front. Our quality in the back almost killed us. And let's give credit to Leno today because he was stealth at the back. But that's my point is you can't go, you can't give me in the hole at half time against Spurs and just expect that we're going to be second half Arsenal like we've been this season. I think that's the difference. Kev, can I ask you a question? So I, sort of, yeah. I, I sort of get what you're both saying. I'm sort of a bit more with Sophie on this. What we're saying is, if we go, if we go, and I, um, I, anyway, <laughs> you throw me off when you do that. <laughs> Kev, if we turn up at the Emirates, like we do, and like we have, they will pick us off. So what she's saying is, that can't happen. We cannot play as we have done today. What we need is right. We need the ground to be rocking, which I think it will be. It's quite a good time, 2.15 on a Sunday. Uh, we need the team to kick off in the first half would be good and not let us concede because I think our little luck's going to run out soon. I, You know, you were right. We have to give you right. You said 2-1. You said a hard-fought game. You were right. I was praying. Well done, Kev. Yeah. I well was, done, Kev. A couple of times he's got it right this year. I, I was praying I wasn't going to be right at 2-0. Um, absolutely praying that you were going to be right. And you were. So can you understand what Sophie's trying to say? If we do play like we did against Wolves and Bournemouth, do you not think after watching Tottenham yesterday, they weren't bad yesterday. I know Chelsea were awful, but Tottenham actually played well. Do you think... Am Amanda, Go on. It's, it's like you're not listening to what I'm saying. You've <laughs> got to take every game separately. Live, live, Liverpool game and the Wolves game. Yeah. Both at the Emirates. Performances were chalk and cheese. I get that. Right. So you're now, saying to me that Tottenham on Sunday could be completely different to, it's to what we be saw. Complete, yeah. It's going to be completely different because everybody knows what's at stake. I, I agree with that, but it doesn't mean it's going to be different. What she's saying is if we do turn up like we have done, I know what you're saying. It could the atmosphere, everything is going to be hopefully like the Liverpool match, yeah, where we kicked off from minute one. Exactly. Yes, but we did. Can you categorically put your hand on your heart and say it is? No, we can't because we have been inconsistent. Yeah, that's okay, all that's I'm fair saying. Enough. We have been, and we don't the, know. The but best what... thing. Come. Sorry, sorry, Amanda. The best thing that happened to us. The listen. I sent this message to you guys because I shared it with my little Spurs cousins who are euphoric again as they were <laughs> post Real Madrid. Their little WhatsApp group. I'm the only gooner in the WhatsApp group with seven Tottenham fans and two Man United fans. And you can imagine how that goes. But my point was this North London derby is poised just the way I wanted it. Spurs are coming off an emphatic thrashing of Chelsea. Their cockerel is so large right now. OK, <laughs> they think that they can conquer the Premier League and the world. This is exactly where we want Spurs. They're being lauded by the media. Everyone loves Pochettino and Arsenal going into this, just scraping by beating Bournemouth. We're the underdog once again. 
And this happened two seasons ago. Remember that game at the Emirates on that soggy, soggy, soggy Saturday? I can't remember if it was a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. I think it was a Saturday. Saturday. And Mustafi, what? Mustafi scored the header, right? And boom, we're 1-0 up. And no one was expecting us to win that game. And we ended up winning that game 2-0. This is the same recipe, you guys. Everyone going into that game thought we were going to get thrashed. Everyone thought that they were going to blast us. North London derbies are different to every other game. With that, I do agree with Kev in that you've got to take that one game at a time, especially this game. But for this game, we have to be better than we have been in our last couple of games. That's all. Yeah. And I, get, and and I actually, agree. We, if if yeah. we're going to get anything, we have to, of yeah, course. I get what both of you are saying 100%. now. 100%. Okay, but so... Can we put our hand on our heart and say we will? We'd certainly hope so. You know, in our mind, they better... All right, Kev, we can't play three at the back against Spurs. Do we agree? No chance. No chance. No chance. We'll get no killed, chance. right? We can't Four, do that. 4-3-3. Three, 4-3-3, three. Three, three. absolutely. 4-3-3 three, three will play. And so who – I'd love to know. Um, obviously, Mustafi and, and Sogradis. Do you play holding or do you play Sogradis in that game? Or Mustafi, who, who do you play in that back? Bellerin, of course. It's going to have to be Kalasi Natural Lichsteiner. Actually, in this game, I'd play Lichsteiner because he's a badass and he's going to piss off some Spurs players. Who's your back four? I'd love to know, you and Amanda. Well, I think, obviously, Bellerin plays right back. If it was me, I mean, I think Mustafi sometimes is a bit rash. And, you know, he goes into some challenges that, wow, is just careless. So I'd play Socrates uh, beside Bellerin. I'd play Holdin and Kalasanac will be left back. And then your midfield is Xhaka Torreira? Xhaka Torreira, Ozil, Abamian, Laka, Laka and Iwobi. OK. That's my team with Leno in goal. Who's on yeah. the bench? <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> Anyone. Anyone after that. Bring them all on. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, but you know what, though? Our bench has been very important. When he's made those subs, it's made a difference. So you may laugh, yeah. you two, at me. But I'm <laughs> I'll telling put you. Smith Rowe. Get Smith Rowe out there. Become an instant <laughs> coal hero. Lit Leddy came on today, didn't he? Yes, yep. he did. That's he he did. did. Good to see. Okay, so I've he had two, two trains of thoughts today. Um, wow. Is yeah. your brain hurting? I, as you both know, because <laughs> you have my WhatsApp <laughs> voice notes, um, I was, I went mental when Mustafi did what he did in the 90s. Am I allowed to play it on here? No. Yeah. Kevin. Oh my God, yeah. No. Actually. No, 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 Where no. Where is no. it? No. No, oh, you cannot play it. Thank you. Anyway, moving on. Just the one. No. Wait, just the one. No. No and no. Um, Come on. I need to, I'm trying to find a, it, Kev. No, we're on a professional pod. Just shush. No, and we're, are you I'm always saying you we're not professional, we're just fans. I'm and then not, when I want to be professional, I'm now professional. I'm not giving my permission to use it, so you can't. So, um, <laughs> Mustafi, shut up, Kevin. So, Mustafi, okay. I went mental, as you know, that he's done that in the 94th minute and 10 seconds, right? But, but I was speaking to a couple of friends, you know, and apparently it was a very good idea of what he did because... They could have scored from what Mustafi... Right, help. No, Bellerin was in front of him. Bellerin was in Bellerin front of was someone right else. There. Okay, yeah, come See, on. I, I haven't watched it again, but it was just the conversation after. Yeah, okay, so I wanted to get your view on that. Okay. I, I think he's... I think he's a liability. Yeah. I, just, I just don't know. I can't work Mustafi out. Sometimes I think he's okay, and sometimes I don't. Um, no, we definitely, definitely can't play three at the back. Look, Xhaka... Xhaka, Socrates, and um, Mustafi are red card liabilities in the North London derby. And Socrates has never played in a North London derby before. Okay. Mustafi and Xhaka have. Now, a lot of people are commenting about Xhaka and how he behaved after his yellow card today. And I agree. I think he showed a level of um, his head. He, he, he made better decisions. Right. right? But he also gave the ball away a lot more when Torreira went off. Would you agree, Kev, that that there seems to be Xhaka now, I think, really relies on Torreira to be able to actually be the player that we've always hoped he could be? Yes. 
Yes. Right. He leans right? on him quite a bit, yeah. Right. So I think with Xhaka, I'm hoping he's mature. I hope he's not going to pull a, pull a Coquelin. You know what I mean? Um, like uh, Coquelin did in that 2-2 uh, a couple of years ago where Harry Kane scored that insane goal and then Alexis got the equaliser with a Lloris blunder. So discipline is huge in this game. And it's going to be important for a Xhaka who's taking the leadership role as captain really to heart. And I like seeing that about him. I've given him so much crap, but I do like what he's saying about this responsibility. And Emery sees something in this guy that he trusts in training week in, week out. So I'm going to ride that wave for a little bit and not get too upset about Xhaka being in the team. Um, but... We really need the Jackers and the Ozils to guide some of those other players that haven't really been in this moment before. But we also need Ozil to have a massive game. We need Ozil, Oba and Laka to be massive in this game because we know we're going to concede. But these guys have to be on their game. And the one player that can't play in this, and Amanda, I'll let you take it away after this for a little rant, is Mkhitaryan. What has happened to Omiki Yosafain? You don't actually blow my mind anymore, hey, Mickey. Do you know what? I don't know. I he, I think he's getting worse every game that I see him. He's such a shame. I, I, I really enjoyed him when he first came, but not anymore. And I don't understand why he wasn't substituted. This is the first time I've queried it. Some Someone was saying to me that it's to gain his confidence back. But uh, it's quite important at 2-1. Well, I'm not worried about his confidence, if I'm honest. But you know what? Emery got it right. We didn't lose. Kev, what do you think's happened to him? I think he's lacking confidence, if I'm honest right, with so you. Is that reason? You, you know, when, when, you, when you're actually playing and things don't come off, it, mm-hmm. you can, your, your confidence level can drop because it's not coming off for mm. you. No player goes out there to play poorly. No, of course but not. But it's just not coming off for him. Maybe he needs to, you know, have, a, have time on the sideline and then come in again and, and may influence the game from the bench or something like that, but he just seems to be lacking a little bit of confidence for me. Yeah. And, and do you know what? It makes such a difference when Ramsey comes on, doesn't it? Well, In what I, way? Well, well, I just feel like he's, I feel like, I know it sounds odd being the fact he's quite young, but I feel like a like a, a dad was coming on the pitch. He took the ball. He knew what to do with a couple of minutes to go. He wasn't being stupid. You know, he was trying to keep possession. I want to know something, Kev, because another one of my voice knows. I'm screaming for them to keep possession and go to the corner flag. Well, what are they doing? And Go on, sorry. Go, no, go on. You were going to say something. I was going to say something about Iwobi, okay? Now, I do blame him partly for the first goal, absolutely. But I also oh, 100% blame... it was But his hold on, fault. hold on. It, yeah, but we're down the other end, so they still got to go through the whole team to score. Yeah, right. but we, were, we weren't covered at the back there. But, we were but, actually in their penalty box. We were on the attack. But hold on a second. You've got Don't our... try and pivot in the, yeah. in the penalty box and be flash, dude. But, Just but, make a pass. Okay, so he's partly to blame. But where's our midfield and defence? I'm not being fair. Where are they? So I, I'm not going to blame Awobi for that for the, for that completely. That's what I'm trying to say. But, Kev, let, let's just go back to my previous point about Ramsey. I, I like it when he comes on, but I want to know why they don't go to the corner flag. Uh, maybe they're trying to score again. <laughs> you don't do that, <laughs> though, Kevin. You know, no, but, you, but that's the – you think about it, the mentality isn't sometimes to hold on to it. Sometimes the mentality is we can score again because they've got that much belief in themselves. So, you know, they'd rather win 3-1, but it, it doesn't make great for the nerves of the no. Arsenal fans, does it? No. You know, when, when no. they play like that. <laughs> Possession you know, is much more important. Yeah, you know yeah that. it's terrible. It is terrible. To retain it. But, but I think a lot of Arsenal fans, uh, like yourself, are considering, you know, the game management. Where is the game management? Just to concede before half time. Fair enough, you're in the attack, but you've got to make sure you shut up the shop and go in at one. Yeah. You know, you have to do that. And Arsenal just seem to lack that game management at times, especially for end of the first half and second half. So who do you blame? Do you blame Iwobi or the rest of the team or what? What's your opinion? No, I, I don't blame Iwobi. Look, if. If a, if a forward loses the ball at the top end of the pitch, that's the place to lose it. That's now, they've point. got to travel 80, 80 90 point. yards yep. to score. And 
someone's got to take one for the team. Bring someone. Yeah, but down. when we're playing, when we're playing three at the back, we become vulnerable in that situation, don't we, Kev? Because now the team is on a counter attack, and we've committed mm. the wing backs to the attacking play, and Torreira's positioning. I'll give you that. In that, in that, in that equaliser, Torreira's positioning was completely off. But we were in the penalty box at that point and looked like we were at, at actually going to score. And so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, but 100%, like at that point, we're committed because we're play our, the system we're playing makes us vulnerable on the counter. And that was my point earlier. Like if Bournemouth can do that to us, what could a team like Tottenham taste like vinegar coming out of my mouth with the way they're playing over the last couple of weeks can do that? You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but look, when you're a defender, when mm -hmm. when it's, you're a defender in a team and the team are attacking, mm -hmm. the defenders have to think the negative part. We are going to lose it, you know. We have to make sure we stabilize in the center of the pitch. You've got to start. You've got to think like a defender in order to protect your goal. And it may seem crazy that you're on the attack, but that's the way defenders have to think. What I believe is everyone starts thinking of attack. The defensive side goes out the window. And then mm. when we lose it, that's why we're so open. It's crazy. But it's funny. That never really happened against Liverpool. No, we were more disciplined against it's, Liverpool. This is the respect factor, is it not? Exactly. That's why we've got to take it on a game-by-game -game Yeah, basis. I know what you're saying. You know, because... It's they respect Liverpool enough that they cannot mess about. We want the Xhaka who played against Liverpool, not the Xhaka who played against Wolves, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. You know? I think... So that, so I, that, respect on, for, <laughs> that respect for the opposition actually counts. It really does count. And they they will be better against Spurs. I hope, uh, I hope and I believe they will be. I'm looking forward to it. I believe that. I want to just say, I though, believe that. I think Mustafi should have taken him out. That's what she said, take one for the team. But anyway, yeah. let's not dwell on it. We won. It's 17 unbeaten. It's very exciting times still. We're one point behind Chelsea. If we beat Spurs, we'll level with them. You know, <laughs> the season isn't so bad at the moment, is it? We're in the uh, Haribo Cup, as I call it. We're playing them in a couple of weeks. So let's just, as we do, game by game. So... As we're discussing this, let's have a prediction, Soph. All right. Are and we remember, not? Are we going to do? Are we going to do Twitter questions on Twitter then? Because we've run out of time. Because I think we, we should. Have so I much think fun with Theo. What okay. we'll do is because we work really hard and Kevin doesn't. Kevin can answer them all. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, it's so much better when Kev answers them anyway. To be honest with you. <laughs> all right, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if there's anyone who's on all the time, it's. Uh, and by the way, I'd like to throw it out there to my comrades here. They've been doing an amazing job with the pod lately and um, I've been so busy at work and it's been a bit tough. And I just wanted to say thanks to everyone. I lost my my, my best friend, my, my dog Dino, who I've had for 15 years. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who reached out and um, and said, you know, that sent their condolences. You, uh, If you are a dog lover and you have a dog, they really are part of the family and the unconditional love they give you every single day fills your heart and your soul with so much happiness and they fill the house with a vibe that sometimes we humans can't. So I just wanted to say thank you, you guys. You rock and um, you've been amazing. So I love you guys. Lovely. Aww. Lovely. Well, big hug from us anyway. You know that. Yeah. Yeah, let's get stuck into some predictions. Right, well, you're not Dino allowed to change want. them because King Kev has a go at you if you change predictions. So whatever you say now is your prediction <laughs> for the Tottenham match. <laughs> are, we doing Tottenham or are we doing Tottenham or are we going to do Volska Moshka first? Uh, no, let's just go Tottenham. Not many people are interested in Volska away because we've qualified and it's Volska away. Okay, and also we should just send all of the children and their children to that match. Agreed? Oh, send the youngsters. Oh, yeah. The third yeah. team, definitely. All right, Tottenham at home. I fancy us in this game because I think that even with Wenger's team, there was something about Wenger that he translated to the squad where they knew what it meant to play Tottenham. And I have a feeling that Emery is able to do the same 
because Emery's been involved in massive derbies in Spain and in France. He gets it. And so this is why I feel like in the interdoll, he was prepping more for Tottenham than he was for Bournemouth. And it showed today a little bit. So I'll give him a pass. So I will say that we will win the North London derby 3-2. Oh, my God. Bank it, baby. That's what I was going to say. All right, well, I'm going with it the same. I'm saying 3-2 because that's what I was going to (laughs) say. I I don't take it. I don't need the spiel to go with it. I'm just saying 3-2. Kev? I'm going uh, 2-1. Right. I believe it's going to be pretty tight. There's going to be – obviously, nobody's going to want to give an inch on the day. But I I just believe Arsenal, being on this run at the Emirates, the Emirates will be rocking. Yeah, rocking. And I, I, I truly believe he's making sure Lacazette's going to be fit for that yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. He's not, he's not going to take a chance on that groin. He's going to make sure he's fit. So, and I think Lacazette's going to come back with a bang. And uh, we're going to win that game 2-1. All right. Well, you're 2-1. Me and Sofa 3-2. May have done that with Ozil today as well. Put him I on was the bench, say not that, bringing him BG. on. Yeah, yeah. Yes. He's yes, not stupid. Yes. Listen, as Kev said, you know, what well, you said, he knows what the derby's about. He's a yeah. <laughs> he's a professional manager. He knows Ozil's on the bench if he needs him. He obviously felt he didn't. I've got no problem with that at all. So we're going to be ready. We will be okay. ready for that game. We so will be. This this game, this build up for me is so stressful <laughs> because <laughs> ever, since 1970, God knows what. This week before we go to White Hart Lane or we went to Highbury was always so. Like you get to Friday and you're just plutzing for England and everyone knows what that means. And I'm so excited to be going back to the Emirates next week and it's Tottenham because they do think they're going to beat us. I've got many Tottenham friends that do think they're going to beat us. As you said, so they played against Chelsea. They're cocky. They think they're, you know, the bee's knees. So... It's going to be good, and we need to rock that ground. We need to drone them out with that stupid effing song, right, and just sing our hearts out all the game. Yes! Go on, you gunners! Exactly! All week it'll be like this each night. (laughs) 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 And I'll be sitting there screaming my head off. Bloody Tottenham. So, oh, yeah, God, no. I we've got to win. It. We've got to we've win. Got, we know we got have to win. to win. We do. We do. We've we got do. to win. Because Come if on. we don't win, forget the rivalry. It's six points ahead of us. And I know it's only virtually, it'll be what near, well, December, but I don't know. No, want four. Them. No, they're, they're three points. Yeah, and if they win, it'll be six. Oh, I thought you meant if we draw. Yeah. No, no, if they no. Win, yeah. Yeah. No, no. We've got to win. And normally I would say I'd take a draw, but I wouldn't on no. this. No. 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 We're all no. going for a win. Um, I don't care who's right that day. As long as one of us is, it doesn't matter. So, yeah. um, I feel like this could be the moment Ozil truly, truly, my hair's going up. Stop me. <laughs> I do feel, Kev, Amanda. <laughs> I love it. I feel it. like it can't this go any higher. Moment. I feel like this is his moment. This is the game where he solidifies his legendary status at the club. This game with some type of magical moment, I feel it. Harry Kane's going to have one because he loves to score against us. But Ozil has to have the final say. Do you know and what? I feel like this is game. <laughs> I, I don't. I'm not saying it isn't, but I, I have a little feeling for Xhaka in this game. An absolute screamer. I don't know when. I'll take it. I don't know when, but I've just got a feeling, and he has calmed down with the red cards and stuff, and I don't really see that happening. To be honest, they're not like they were when Kevin was playing in the 80s. It's very different playing them now. And, um, yeah. Well, all I can say is it's very exciting with the build up. Yes, we do play full scluff Thursday night. We hope that we take the kids. We've already qualified. We're not dismissing it, but it's really not of interest now as we have qualified. Let's take the kids and let's get this build up ready. And come next Sunday at two fifteen, that Emirates better be rocking. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, because after that we got Man United. It just and... it comes thick and fast, and we play Liverpool at the end of that month as well. That's so, right. Right, you two. Thank you very much. It was fabulous having Theo on. Fabulous speaking to you two. But always Arsenal.